A very good evening to all of you. With immense pleasure and pride, I welcome all of you to the seventh Suresh Tendulkar Memorial Lecture. This Memorial Lecture is a brainchild of Dr. Professor Chandiramani. She has been putting in a lot of effort for conducting these series of lectures. And this year, with a lot of pride, I welcome you all to listen to Professor Basu. We at SSC, although SSC is a bride, it is young. It was established in 2008. It is a young, vigorous and growing institution with a perceptible record of success. This niche institute seeks to develop intellectual discipline, critical thinking, and an analytical bent of mind that can apply taught concepts to practice and solve real world problems. We at SSC have built an educational environment committed to excellence and academic freedom, such that our graduates can excel not only in their chosen career paths, but all walks of life. This year, we will be welcome, uh, welcoming our 14th batch for BSc and 11th batch for MSc Economics. We at SSC follow the RPI model, which focuses on academics, research, placement of students, not only in companies, but in the society, internationalization and enhanced engagement. Led by Professor Chandramani, who has more than 35 years of experience in teaching, research and institutional building, we are adapting to the changing academic environment. As per the words of our director ma'am, Symbiosis School of Economics is a place where knowledge, intellect, and diversity come together to stimulate young minds, creating a class of promising economists and social change makers for a better tomorrow. With this quote, I would like to welcome our director ma'am, Professor Chandramani, to please introduce the lecture and start it officially. Ma'am, please. Thank you, Niharika. Uh, on behalf of the faculty, students, and staff of Symbiosis School of Economics, I take this uh, opportunity to welcome Professor Koshik Basu to deliver the seventh Professor Suresh Tendulkar Memorial Lecture on the theme and the topic, the Indian drama, 30 years of economic reforms and what lies ahead. I also take this opportunity to welcome Mrs. Sunetra Tendulkar, who has been here with us and has given us the consent to institute this memorial lecture. Let me, at this point, introduce our speak, uh, our, uh, you know, Professor Tendulkar, you know, in whose honor this lecture has been instituted. Born on February 15th, 1939, in Kolhapur district of Maharashtra, he completed his school from Pune, and his college from Pune, completed his master's in economics and statistics from Delhi School of Economics, and then completed his PhD from Harvard University on his thesis on some experiments in multi-sectoral planning model for India with Professor Hothakar and Shenery as his supervisors. Over the course of time, he has taught at the Delhi Center of the Indian Statistical Institute between 68 and 78. Uh, he's been the professor at the Department of Economics, Delhi School of Economics be between 1978 and 2004. Managing editor of the Journal of Indian Economic Review during 1981 to 86. Head department of DSC. And then he went on to becoming the director of DSC between 1995 and 1998. Um, Further, he was member of the, of the expert group on estimation of proportion and number of poor in 1993, a member of the Fifth Pay Commission, um, 1994 to 97, the Disinvestment Commission, 1996 to 1999, and it goes on 
In fact, one of his key uh, posts that he did hold was that as member of the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council, 2004 to 2008, and chairman of the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council, 2008-9. He was also chairman of the expert group to review the method methodology for estimation of poverty. Professor Tendulkar will always remain one of India's most outstanding academicians and public servants. In all his assignments in the diverse councils, commissions, and committees, he has put in tremendous amount of time and effort and above all brought to all of them an enormous amount of personal integrity. Uh, this was really the formal uh, introduction of Professor Tendulkar. But from here, uh, I first heard him at the BMCC College when he spoke about um, liberalization in the early 90s. And I think um, we found his speech, his thoughts so clear and so uh, fascinating. And I knew that he was a Punekar at that point of time. So that was the first time I met him. When I joined Sembaisa School of Economics, and we were going to launch our master's program, I knew that I would want him to be the mentor to us. So I thought, let my program start and I will reach out to Professor Tendulkar. But by the time our program did commence in July of 2011, Professor Tendulkar was no more. And it was only in 2015 when I went across to Mumbai to meet Mrs. Tendulkar and their daughter, Sai, that I got the you know, uh, permission from them to in institute this lecture. Though we have not had that kind of an opportunity to meet Professor Tendulkar, but in his very presence, we are blessed because each year when I, you know, invite somebody to, to deliver the lecture, I find it, you know, people are absolutely, uh, they find it difficult to refuse. The first such speaker was Subir Gokan, who was a student. The second was Mahindra Dev, who was also his student. And you know the list that is so long that, you know, and today we have Professor Kaushik Basu. I think the bar of this memorial lecture has really gone up. Uh, to tell you more about Professor Tendulkar, I think it would be just right if I would ask my colleague and friend, Dev Kusum Das, because he has been mentored by Professor Tendulkar, to come up and say a few words about Professor Tendulkar. Thank you, Jyoti. Uh, it's a privilege and honor to speak a few lines about Professor Suresh Tendulkar. Uh, I happened to be a student at the MA program at the Delhi School of Economics in late 1980s. Uh, he was undoubtedly one of the finest teachers at the school. He taught important courses like EDPI, Economic Development and Planning, and Applied Industrial Economics and his expertise in fields of India's industrialization and uh, reforms is known to all scholars, particularly also his uh, writings on poverty uh, measurement, et cetera. Uh, I've also benefited from his role as my advisor for my PhD dissertation and uh, would always remember him for, for beautiful handwriting that Professor Tendulkar had. And he used to give his comments handwritten on the sides of computer printouts in, uh, in a very, very lucid handwriting. It was, so, it was a pleasure to read those and through which one learned the analytics of research. And uh, I will end by a very small uh, line that he was the chairperson of a jury which awarded me the Exim Bank Prize for the best doctoral dissertation while congratulating me on the award, he also told me in his office at the Delhi School of Economics, do not ever think that I was instrumental in getting you this award. This award is a recognition of your hard work. To me, it was the highest display of academic ethics of which he was an avatar. And uh, the professional world of economics lost Professor Tendulkar very early, and he had substantial contributions more to make. To, uh, today, in Professor Koshik Basu picked up a topic which was very close to Professor Tendulkar's heart because he wrote a lot on economic reforms, industrialization in India. Thank you, Jyoti. Um, I have a double thank you to say to you, Dev Kusundas. One is that you've come and spoken a few words about 
uh, Professor Tendulkar. And if I have an association with Professor Basu, it's truly, truly thank you to Dev Kusumdas. And I have to share this with everybody who's here today. That Dev Kusumdas has been a kind of a little mentor to us through the process of our admissions over the last few years since 2013. And um, thank you so much for your association, your guidance, and being such a great friend. Thank you. I really hold Simbasa School of Economics as a great institution. And this is evident from the quality students that you produce every year. And I get to see them at the South Asia Economic Students Meet. Thank you, Jyoti. Thank you. Uh, I now go on to just, uh, you know, lay the context to today's talk and, you know, talk about the economic reforms in 1991. Some of us have probably seen equal number of years before and after the reforms. And therefore we have some kind of experiential, uh, you know, uh, takeaways from that. So when I think about the eighties, the decade before the 1991 reforms, what really came to my mind? And it was the bank nationalization that happened in 1980, April, six of them with the objective of ensuring that there was better credit delivery to the priority sector. I remember the 1980s being the year where Maruti Suzuki joint venture did take its, you know, take off and became a very uh, popular company in the country and we saw new cars come in. A spate of joint ventures that took place between Hero Honda, In Suzuki, Kinetic Honda, DCM Toyota, TVS Suzuki, some successful and some not so successful. The 1980s saw the investment to GDP ratio, which increased from 19% of the GDP to 25% in the early 80s. Uh, of course, very much led exclusively in the public sector. However, the decade from 1979 onwards also saw a little bit of a stress that got, you know, this was the good side that I talked about, but the stress here was large devolution of funds to state government as was recommended by the Seventh Finance Commission, rightfully so, but it did have its impact on the fiscal deficit in the 1980s, which peaked to 6.5% during this period. Uh, which is what we uh, have peaked at at this point in 2021. The current account deficits also started inching up on sluggish exports and high demand for imports and reached the high of 3.5% of the GDP. Food inflation doubled to nearly 13.5%. And then during this period, we had the backdrop of the Gulf War and its impact on falling remittances. Uh, we saw our foreign exchange reserves from January 1991 from $5 billion coming down to $1 billion and just enough to meet two weeks imports. So this was the backdrop on which the reforms were, were you know, initiated. Of course, the reforms were not a prescription that came in overnight, but it took 18 months um, and was debated by various uh, you know, uh, governments in, in, during that era, during that period very often referred to as liberalization, privatization, and globalization. You had the new economic policy, which took off with trade policy interventions, rationalization of tariffs, right from 300% to 35, and that exchange rate adjustment. In the words of Rangarajan, it was given the code name, hop, skip, and jump, a step-by-step -step approach for exchange rate devaluation, which was done in two steps and your convertibility, which happened from LERMS, that's liberalized exchange rate management system to the dual exchange rate mechanism to partial convertibility on the capital account. This was followed by industrial licensing, disinvestment. And um, you know, one thing that really has come through is that our foreign exchange reserves from the very low of 1 billion US dollars in June, 1991, has inched up to $500 billion in February 2021. The reforms have undoubtedly enhanced India's external position with respect to foreign exchange reserves. No, Professor Kaushik must be wondering, you know, whether I'm really going to speak, uh, you know, a lot on the, uh, you know, economic reforms, but not really so. Uh, this was just laying the context of what was there in the decade before the reforms. But the 1990s, 
um, you know, from my perspective, because I, I talk about urban development and livability index, I think a very big move during that time was the UNDP launched human development index, you know, which became the first global measure. Um, this was also included in India's eighth five-year plan between 1992 and 97. Uh, during the 90s, the decade of the 90s, we had the financial crisis, the Asian financial crisis. Luckily, India was spared in this one, but that was not the case a decade later. Um, 1998 put India reasonably integrated into the world with its international nuclear, you know, into nuclear mainstream with the testing of, you know, Pokhran II. And the golden quadrilateral, the great, um, you know, roadways that got developed in 1999 and is now into phase one, two, and three, National Highway Development Project. 2002, a great year again, because the government of India relinquished the control of Maruti Suzuki. If you remember, I talked to you about it in the 1980s. You know, how the government went shopping to get a car maker to ensure that we become a great automobile company, you know, manufacturing hub, which we did. And thereafter, to me, the decade, the two decades of the 21st century, I really look at it as the decade of social inclusion for India. Because you had the Narega Act, you know, in 2005, which proved to be very effective instrument that could address uh, economic emergency in rural areas during the pandemic. Um, you had the Right to Education Act in 2009. Of course, you had the financial crisis and its stimulus that happened. And we know where that, uh, you know, where we went over there in terms of fiscal deficit inflation touching 14% and we breaching our fiscal deficit targets once again. The Right to Food Security in 2013 the Jandhan Yojana in 2014, and we can go on because it's the Swachh Bharat Mission, Prime Minister's Avas Yojana, demonetization, GST, and of course, the pandemic. Uh, 30 years has been a great time, and in the words of Rangarajan, he says, we have another opportunity for the next 30 years to convert another set of reforms to take India into the future. India is going to turn 75 in 2022. The government in its economic survey has put forward the basic necessities index in the 10th chapter, wherein it talks about the progress on housing, water, sanitation, electricity, and clean cooking fuel, which are synchronous to live a decent life. The bare necessities index, 26 indicators, five dimensions, have been measured between 2012 and 18, and of course shows that there is work in progress. Uh, moving forward, we know that growth is going to be a very important mantra for us to achieve the SDGs and the bare necessities that we are looking forward to. Uh, I do believe India is poised in 2021 for yet another opportunity. And I hope we are going to be able to see the GDP from 2000, approximately 2000, you know, where we are in the low middle income economy, jump up to upper middle income economy. I'm sure that's going to happen someday, but we hope that's going to be done at a fast pace. Setting this context, over to you, Professor Basu, for your lecture on the Indian drama, 30 years of economic reforms, and what lies ahead. Oh, sorry for interrupting, sir. But thank you so much, Jyoti ma'am, for laying the background. I know sir needs no introduction at all. And everyone knows Professor Basu. But I would uh, like to just come in over here for a small introduction about sir, which he definitely doesn't need. Dr. Basu is the professor of economics and Karl Marx professor of international studies at Cornell University. He's currently the president of International Economic Association. He has been senior vice president and chief economist of the World Bank. And prior to that, chief economic advisor to the Indian government from 2009 to 12. Sir has received his doctorate and master's from the London School of Economics. And he's done his bachelor's from St. Stephen's College, Delhi. 
Sir has received honorary doctorates from several institutes throughout India and the world. Dr. Basu has published widely in the areas of development economics, industrial organization, game theory, and welfare economics. His two most recent books are An Economist in the Real World, The Art of Policy Making in India, and The Republic of Beliefs, A New Approach to Law and Economics. Dr. Basu has contributed pop to popular articles to magazines, newspapers, and so on in various reputed newspapers. In May 2008, he was awarded with the highest civilian award in India, that is Padma Bhushan, by President of India. Dr. Basu has held visiting positions at the Institute for Advanced Studies, Princeton, and the London School of Economics, Howard University, Princeton University, and MIT. He was professor of economics at Delhi School of Economics, where in 92, he founded the Center for Development Economics and was its first executive director. He's also one of the founding members of Madras School of Economics. I personally have heard Sir in a couple of conferences at Indian Society for Labor Economics, and I am quite keen to hear him again. With this, I invite you, Sir, to please give the talk of the evening. Welcome, Sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Niharika, for that generous introduction. Thank you very much, uh, Jyoti Chandiramani, your director, for laying out the ground and also for the invitation to give this talk. Wonderful to see Dev Kushum here and Mrs. Tendulkar. After several years we are meeting, it's a, it's a pleasure to see you again. Um, I have to say, listening to your uh, earlier, before we started formally, descriptions of what's happening in symbiosis, it just gives me a rush of hope because it is this sector, the sector of knowledge, knowledge creation, which is going to dominate the world. And to hear the excitement of the kind of activity taking place gives me hope, hope for India. Thank you, uh, thank you for the invitation. And let me just also mention that the name of this lecture as Jyoti rightly uh, mentioned, uh, the Suresh Tendulkar Memorial Lecture makes it very, very special for me. It's an absolute honor to give the seventh Suresh Tendulkar Memorial Lecture. You know, in the field of measuring poverty, inequality, doing it statistically, scientifically, India is an absolute global pioneer. Uh, and this you don't have to take from me. Angus Deaton has written about it. The early statistical techniques that were being used, India was the forerunner in the world. It began, of course, goes back to the 1940s, even 1930s, Mahalanobis, and the National Sample Survey starting out. But I think the second biggest rush of activity in this is what was being done by Suresh Tendulkar. Suresh was again a foremost player in the world. His work was based on India, but the methodology is something that was meant for the world and Suresh at the Delhi School of Economics at that time was really just very, very important. Along with Sundaram, my colleague, when I had joined Delhi School, this was, India was in the forefront, Delhi School was in the forefront of this research because of Suresh Tendulkar. He was on the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council and I missed him very narrowly. When I joined the Indian government in 2009, Tendulkar had just given up. Uh, the uh, uh, position. And then, of course, we do know the very, very unfortunate news of his passing in uh, 2011. But it is a life to be celebrated, and it is in that spirit that I'm going to talk uh, today. My aim here is to review the Indian economy over the last 30 years, 1991 to 2021. And if you look at it carefully, it deserves every bit the adjective drama. I mean, the change that has taken place in India is nothing, nothing short of dramatic. I mean, the Asian drama, of course, I'm playing on the title, which was Gunnar Mirdal talking about the rise of Asia. But now India is a microcosm of that. And from really from the early 1990s, the change and the rise of India has been absolutely stunning. If you just go back to a little bit before that, I'm taking the same liberty that Jyoti took of talking a little bit also before that to, as a preamble uh, to this. Early 1980s, I'm thinking of early 1980s or even 
78, 79, I had just joined the Delhi School of Economics. Suresh Tendulkar was uh, uh, that time there at the Delhi School of Economics. And in many ways, the atmosphere was very different from what you can imagine now. It was a sort of laid back atmosphere. We were never thought of India as a fast growing economy. We were very proud of India. And I have to say the Delhi School of Economics, all this is rushing into my mind back again, listening to Symbiosis, um, your school of economics was a very simple place. The professors coming on their bicycles, uh, very, very prominent world famous professors coming on their bicycles, parking their bicycles and coming into the classroom, sitting at the coffee house and but bustling with ideas. And really at that time, the atmosphere there at the Delhi School of Economics intellectually was comparable to any place in the world. But as far as the economy goes, India was nothing to talk about. And we were all aware of that, that India had had a remarkable past. It is true that India's emergency was a blot on its reputation. The two years, 1975 to 1977, should never have happened. Fortunately, an election was called in 77, an election that was conducted fairly, and the emergency was defeated. That was the end of that, but just the two year period. If you go back to 1947 and look at that stretch, there's no other country in the world which had become independent then with all the idealism of that independence that had survived this stretch with the early idealism. There is the atmosphere therefore, in many ways, the economy was really bad, India's economy. It had not taken off, the growth was sluggish, up to already up to 1988, it had remained that way. But in terms of societal development, intellectual development, India was quite remarkable. And the institutions were very strong. A Couple of years ago, three, four years ago, Cornell's former president, Hunter Rawlings, telling me, I remember I felt so proud that as far as freedom of speech and openness to new ideas and criticism goes, India is probably the world leader. And that is the way India was viewed. So there was failure on the one hand, the economy had done very badly, but the institutions had developed. And on the economy, I should tell you that it had done badly. Growth had not picked up. I had done a comparative study of South Korea and um, India a couple of years ago, I had done a study. If you go back to the late 1950s, India and South Korea had virtually the same per capita income. When you come to the early 1990s, 1991, South Korea was 22 times richer than India. So having started at the same level, 22 times richer. But again, it's not to blame the policymakers and what they did. And like now, like in the past, people try to bring in the best ideas of the time and push it. And India began with that, the best ideas of the time. I mean, Nehru was looking around the world for the best ideas, working with Mahala Nobis, a little later, Shukumai Chakravarti, and they put those plans together. And as, a, as the Chinese economist, who was my predecessor at the World Bank, Justin Lin, had once mentioned, in many ways, the Asian countries that took off were the countries that were smaller countries that were getting into trouble, being forced to change their policies because all the countries started roughly with the same policies. The bigger ones, the more stable ones refused to change. The smaller ones were getting into trouble and being forced to change. So it's not to blame, but it is true. The economy was sluggish, but political institutions and generally the spirit of knowledge and culture was very, very high in India, something that we were proud of. Our economy was virtually closed as I will just now give you some data and you will see tariff rates were high. We were not taking in foreign direct investment. So all those things were there, but the economy was also open to ideas. Unlike in many other developing countries, books, controversial books, controversial writings came into India freely. We were treated as mature people who could take this on and debate and discuss. We would reject many of those ideas coming in, but we would see those ideas. That was the India. What I, from 1991, what happened was really a drama. From, it is a difficult for me even to go back 
to then when in the up to the middle of 1980s, we would think of India as a wonderful country, but never thought of India to be in the growth leadership position. But that began changing from 1991. And as Jyoti has just now told you, the change began under pressure. And that almost always happens. A country gets sluggish. Then when you're in trouble, you're forced to face up to the problems and take on the challenge. I will describe this, but before that, since this is a university that I'm talking to, and no doubt there are many students and professors of economics there, I want to point out, point out to an analytical point, a theoretical point in the social sciences, which I think is important and important for us to understand. It's not theory, economic theory in the sense of mathematics that I want to inflict to you. I want to inflict something which is deeper than that. Economic theory analytically gives you some of the most splendid ideas. And I want to bring that up here, put it aside the analytical point and then move forward. You know, economists tend to treat the economy as something which relies on economic policy alone. Get your fiscal policy right, monetary policy right, the economy will grow. But in reality, as writers from the time of Karl Polanyi to others have written about, the economy is embedded in society, in politics, in psychology. I was very pleased to see behavioral economics being taught um, at symbiosis. All these things matter and economics sits in the middle of that. And very often we take the other things for granted, but that can lead to mistakes. And occasionally we have to wake up and ask, what are the underlying things beneath the economics that makes a country grow? Uh, example from geometry, Euclid, the famous Euclid, wrote down the axioms of geometry and this we learn from school, the axioms and theorems we prove. What Euclid did not realize, and it would take many years after Euclid to realize that, that quite apart from the axioms that Euclid had written up, there are also unwritten axioms, axioms which Euclid had assumed, which were in Euclid's head. Much later, when people started bumping into paradoxes, they realized that despite this perfect axiomatic writing, geometry is running into problems. And why? Because it was realized there was one axiom which was never written down as axiom. What was that? The axiom was that the entire geometry is being done on a flat surface not on a spherical surface like the world. That assumption is never written down as an axiom. Euclid assumed it. What else can it be? Never wrote it down. Much later, uh, there were writers, thinkers, Euler, Riemann and others who realized that geometry is running into trouble, not describing the world ac accurately enough because there are assumptions which are not written down. And we may need to do non-Euclidean geometry, change some of those fundamental assumptions and move forward. And really in the world of long distance travel, if we were continuing with the geometry done on a flat surface, we would make huge blunders and mistakes. It was because geometry realized that you need non-Euclidean geometry that geometry moved ahead. On economics, I want to just give you concretely explain and then leave that aside. This is not a lecture on theory, I will put it aside. You know, we all read about the invisible hand and that it can deliver what you want, what society wants. And that was, I never want to discount it, a stunning discovery of Adam Smith going back to 1776. Leave individuals free to pursue their self-interest and society will, will reach optimal conditions. And we write down, we know that there are some axioms which are needed, but these are mechanical axioms we write down, like Euclid did. What we forget is there are many other axioms which we don't write down, but unless those axioms, societal properties are satisfied, even with the best of economic policies, an economy would flounder. One very beautiful example, which I've written about, some of you may know, is the following. You know, if you take rats, uh, rats 
satisfy most of the standard axioms of economics. They are quite greedy like human beings. They like more rather than less. So that when you draw your indifference curves, axiom one, more is better than less, rats satisfy that. There was a very famous experiment done in the University of Texas at Austin, checking that rats satisfy the law of diminishing marginal utility. So rats not only prefer more to less, but if you give them more and more of the same good, that is not as enjoyable. The law of diminishing marginal utility, the utility goes down. But with the axioms of economics satisfied, still we do know, and actually there have been experiments. You don't need experiments for this, you need common sense. Rats do not run a successful economy. They do not do exchange and trade among themselves. They satisfy the axioms of economics, formal economics, but they don't do that. Why? Because there are many other axioms we don't write about. For an economy to succeed, you need to be able to talk. We don't start in an economics book by saying axiom number one, people can talk. That's taken for granted. But many other things are taken for granted. That we respect each, other's, each other a little bit. That we don't use physical violence that we trust one another. These are all social axioms, which we don't write down because we take them for granted. But societies can succeed or fail depending on whether these axioms are satisfied or not. And years ago, I had written a paper on why do we pay up after taking a taxi ride? This was an economic and political weekly. And I was arguing that this you can't explain by pure economics. We pay up after taking a taxi ride because for most of us, not everyone, it's inbuilt as a norm. Once you've taken a ride, you pay up for the ride. These norms play a very, very important role. Put that in the background and keep it because I will intertwine economics with these larger things. Luckily, uh, 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 Jyoti described the 1991 crisis, so I can do that a bit briefly and move on. 1991 was the big crisis. For a big country like India, you need a big crisis to make it possible for change to happen. So even though there were lots of people who were beginning to see that India's license permit Raj, no matter what the objective in the beginning was, was beginning to get rusty and creaky and was hurting the economy, it was not possible to make changes. Then came 1991 and the Gulf crisis, the first Gulf War. It was basically for India around the foreign exchange crisis that again, Jyoti did mention that at one point in early 1991, India had enough foreign exchange reserve for 13 days of normal imports. So India was on the verge of defaulting. The money that India had borrowed from various international sources, India would default. And I should point out that Latin American countries usually are much more risk loving in the international domain. They take money, they default occasionally, tumble, get up and go. India had not done that. For India to default on an international loan would have been an embarrassing incident. So India at, in 1991 had no choice but to go to the IMF. India went to the IMF. India got IMF money with conditionalities. But I should tell you that when a big country gets conditionalities, it's a bit unfair the way the world is. But people get very angry that IMF is imposing conditionalities. But half of those conditionalities were Indians going to the IMF and telling the IMF to tell Indians to do something that India wanted to do. And India was then putting in the reforms in place. But it turned out to be actually quite a turning point because we do know that India did not need the full term of IMF support. After two years, the economy started turning around and India was coming out of the problem. Let me just mention a few things that, again, Jyoti has mentioned, but I should mention, license permit Raj was ended. We took advantage of that, ended it. But these things are not enough. Even after you um, ended license permit Raj, you do want ease of business to be improved. And I'm glad that there has been effort by this government to ease up the atmosphere of doing business in India. And India has had improvements on that score. Foreign direct investment flow into India was eased up. Tariffs were lowered, and this I keep quoting because this sentence is stuck in my head. Manmohan Singh as finance minister saying 
that we now have to bring down India's tariff ceiling to 200%. Bringing down to 200% immediately tells you where had we gone? That most, there are countries that can take it up to 200%, but there were very few countries in the world that can bring it down to 200%. That was the first step. Tariffs were being brought down. Then it was eased up the capital account convertibility. And here is a piece of economics that I want to point out and remind you. And there was, um, uh, I used to earlier in my life, uh, when I started in economics, my interest was in pure theory. But by 1991, I was beginning to get interested in policy economics. And one of my first engagement was a lot of argument with my friends in the economics profession, because I was in support of the government easing, giving up capital controls partially and allowing Indians to take foreign exchange out of the country. And the logic of this, and that's the reason why I feel economics is such an exciting subject. Part of it is wooly, data, intuition, but a part of it is logic, hard logic, statistics that you have to use. Here is one little bit about foreign exchange reserves. When foreign exchange had come down to $1 billion, $1.3 billion, shocking state India was in. But see, one thing that was causing a problem is the Indian regulations that time, the convertibility block was, if an Indian brought foreign exchange into India, it was virtually impossible to take the foreign exchange out of India. So if you've made money in the world abroad, if you bring the money into India, foreign exchange, you can't take it out anymore. There were very, very strict rules. You can take out $200 if you're going out, nothing more, etc. Think of anyone with a little bit of common sense. If you've made a lot of foreign exchange that you may need the foreign exchange again, first thing you'll do is not bring it into India because once you bring it in, you can't take it out. So my intuition was if you allow Indians to take their foreign exchange out, in the beginning, there could be a little bit of panic because people will rush to take it out. But if you can give confidence to people that we will allow you to take your foreign exchange out, foreign exchange will begin to come in. And that is exactly what happened after 1991. And now we have 500 billion, but even within sort of 17, 18 years, foreign exchange reserves for India, which used to be for 20 years, roughly $5 billion. It goes up to $6 billion, comes down to $2 billion, roughly $5 billion. If I was doing it with a PowerPoint, I would have done you 20 years at $5 billion. And then over the next 20 years, $300 billion. Completely changed landscape. India was a part of the global economy. And India's growth takes off for the first time stably. We've had occasional growth spikes in the past, but stably from 1993-4, India is growing at roughly 6% per annum. One crisis comes, a small crisis in 1997. I want to point that out again, because this is again a place where you need a little bit of economic logic, which is interesting. India's growth drops to 4.5% roughly. 1997-1998, the growth is slowing down. What is causing it, it's the East Asian crisis. And the East Asian crisis, which probably starts in Thailand, is again a reminder that once you open up the economy, there will be some special risks. I am for an open economy because I feel it is true that if you keep your economy completely closed, you won't have those risks, but you'll be continuously poor on the floor. So you'll have no risk of falling any further because you'll be on the floor. If you open up the economy, you can take off, you can bigger, become a bigger, more powerful economy, but there will be risks associated with that. You have to learn to handle the risk. 1997 is an excellent example of the risk. And I'm going to briefly discuss uh, the Thai economy. The East Asian countries were all considered very strong. Korea, one of the strongest economies in the world. Taiwan, one of the strongest economies in the world. Thailand, reasonably strong economy in the world. Singapore, one of the strongest economies of the world. That they would crash was unthinkable. It begins in Thailand and escalates all over the place. The logic of that is actually fascinating to see. Thailand's housing market was booming. The stock market was booming. And 
money was coming in from abroad. People were changing their dollars into Thai bahts and investing in the Thai economy. Then the housing market started crashing. When the housing market started crashing, property market started crashing, normally what would have happened in a closed economy is that that does badly. Maybe some corporates get hit, the stock market does badly. That would be the end of it. But when your economy is a reasonably open economy and foreign exchange has come in from abroad to invest in your stock market, in your housing market, when your stock market crashes and the housing market crashes, these foreign players take their money out of the stock market, take their money out of the property market. But since their money had come into Thailand from abroad for the stock market, after they convert, take the money out of the stock market, they do another thing. They take the money out of the country. So they sell Thai bucks and buy back dollars to take the dollars out of the country. In a globalized world, when the stock market crashes, the international money begins to exit the country after taking it out of the stock market. So the exchange rate crashes. So in Thailand, they got a shock when the, there was domestic problem, but the exchange rate began crashing and it's an interconnected world. Then Korea, then Singapore, all these big countries were being hit and India was not too globalized. The effect of the East Asian crisis was being felt in Russia, was being felt in Latin America. India was beginning to uh, be open and India got some of the crisis, not a very big, huge one that happens and hits India in 1997. Uh, then again, India gradually, after a period of difficulty, India picks up. And for me, India's good period of vibrant growth really takes off from 2003 is the year that I take. Before that, things have happened. The reforms of 1991 to 1993 were critical. India needed those big changes, but there were small changes were being made. Jyoti mentioned that investment and savings picking up. Investment and savings picked up hugely in the early 1980s, but the second round of pickup was 2002, three, four, the savings and investment rate was picking up. The year 2003 is stuck in my head because in that year, India's savings rate crosses over 30% of GDP. So India is now like an East Asian country. We used to joke, I remember in Delhi School of Economics in the 1980s sitting in the coffee house, that India is a Latin American country sitting in the middle of Asia. We don't save, we don't grow, we just chat and have a wonderful time. From 2003, India was joining the East Asian countries with the savings and investment rate going up and India's also the growth rate began picking up. And I'll come back to the recent growth story because I do want to, we are in a very difficult situation now. India is at the crossroads. The economy can crash, the economy can do very well. And I want to spend a little bit of a time on that because that is in our collective interest, but give me a moment for, 2003. Another thing happened, which is my theory, I don't know if it is correct, to do with what was happening in America and India's boost. It is one thing which is not just my theory, but I think it is true that from the sort of early 2000 years, United States began to feel that it is a face-to-face -face between US and China, which is not good because Russia's economy has crashed, Russia's gone. So US and China face off, US wanted another few big players because the ideal world is to be the sole authority. But one of the worst worlds to have two big powers. It's better to have many big powers then because you don't want a face off. So US was beginning to concentrate on India, Brazil, other economies trying to prop them up into becoming a major player. But something else happened inadvertently. There was a very conservative right-wing commentator or, um, in, on United States television. Recently, actually, after Biden came to power, he has been taken off the television. This was Lou Dobbs. Lou Dobbs is quite interesting. I've called it the Lou Dobbs effect. I remember in the early 2000s, Lou Dobbs would come on television in the evening, every evening, and berate American entrepreneurs, saying that you people are unpatriotic for the sake of greater profit, you are outsourcing work to 
the faraway countries like India. So you're outsourcing work and Americans are losing jobs over here. He would say every evening on television. I feel that this, I believe this had a very strange effect. You know, on American television in the evening, if you want to advertise anything, it's phenomenally expensive. So to get a slot to advertise that, look, India can provide you outsourcing work for a very low cost. Indian small companies would not be able to advertise on American television in the evening. Lou Dobbs attacking India, Philippines, and other countries repeatedly on television in the evening had the opposite effect. Some American entrepreneurs who didn't know that you can make some extra profit by outsourcing work discovered that you can make that extra profit by outsourcing work. I believe that small Indian companies mushrooming that took place from 2002, three, four, five was effectively the Lou Dobbs effect. The every evening the advertisement being given had exactly the opposite of what Lou Dobbs wanted. It was an advertisement that this is possible. I should put in a footnote over here. I personally don't think it's good for America to stop outsourcing for America's own self-interest. If you stop outsourcing, the American economy will do worse. But today I'm not talking about the American economy. I have solutions for America as well. What America should do, America should continue to outsource and have other policies to shore up its own economy so that it remains globally competitive. Fortunately, we've got a very sensible, sensible, sensitive professional administration in the United States now. So I'm hopeful for America and that is not my talk. So let me move back to India. Then comes 2008, I, the India's growth really takes off 2003, but 2005 to 2008 were the magical years. The three years of growth then was, uh, the, those three years of, was 9.3, 9.2, 10.2. So India grows at well over 9% for three consecutive years. So it's not just a one year spike or a one quarter, quarter spike, three years of over 9% growth. And the language is changing internationally. You could see people, I remember this beautiful article by Martin Wolf saying, move aside the powers of Europe and North America. Here comes the big players from Asia. And he's talking about the rise of Asia that begins to take place. From 2009, I am in India. I mean, I've, I've joined the policy world, I've been called in and, uh, and I've joined with a lot of enthusiasm because I have to say that one thing which made me feel very good is I remember my first meeting with Prime Minister Manmohan Singh, Manmohan Singh that time when I was asked before I said yes, I actually clarified to him that I've never been a member of any political party for no other reason, but I can't take the discipline of a party. I want to just think freely, pursue my ideas and put them forward, but I would love to do it. I would love to help. And we had this conversation. I was given that space and with that I came in. I did create some controversies by occasionally criticizing their own government and the policies that the government was following. But I feel that was useful to bring in ideas in th that space. Let me again, since th this is an economics audience I'm largely talking to, I don't want to talk too much about that period, the period that I was there. It was still very close to my heart and I'm continuing to write about this, but the power of ideas very simple idea one, which many ideas I brought to the table, which I did not succeed to push it through. But that is what a big government, big country. Some people get angry that you bring big ideas and the government does not take it. Well, in a big country like India, there are thousands of ideas floating. And no matter who you are, you can't fret that my good idea is not being taken. There are ideas are floating, you have to try to pursue. But one idea that was taken for the students of economics, microeconomics, it's straight out of microeconomics textbook. So let me give you that. This is in 2009. I had joined government in 2009, December. Tail end of that, or if I'm getting that wrong, it is early 2010. Uh, uh, the prime minister calls a meeting of seven, eight of us. Inflation that time, as you know, was raging. And the food inflation was very high. Food inflation was hitting a 20% mark at that time. And Dr. Manmohan Singh called a meeting of seven, eight of us. And I was very nervous because I had throughout been a professor, never in these kinds of settings, that we had to discuss what to do to bring down food inflation. The point that I was making with the prime minister there was, once inflation gets sparked off, 
to bring inflation down, contrary to what most people believe, you can't do that in a week, you can't do that in a month. If you suddenly try to bring inflation down, you'll crash the economy. To bring inflation down has to be very careful fiscal monetary policies, and you'll take five, six months for the inflation to come down. So overall inflation will take time, but food inflation was disproportionate, and we did want to bring the food prices down. And I had discovered that one thing that was being done by the Indian government was offloading food grain. We had begun to do, you know, India collects food grain through the FCI and the Food Corporation of India. Then we offload the food grain when inflation is high. The way the food grain offloading is done, used to be done that time in India, is you take 1,000 metric tons and have an auction. Some private player gets 1,000 metric tons. Then you take another 1,000 metric tons, auction. Someone else picks it up. 7,000 metric tons, 8,000 metric tons, eight big players take it, and then they go and sell it on the market, and you hope the food price will go down. But if you are letting seven, eight big players buy 7,000, 8,000 metric tons, you are creating a Kurno oligopoly of a few big players. And we do know from the theory of Augustine Kurno from 1838, that if there are seven, eight players selling this product, the prices will come down, but a little bit. But if you have 70, 80 players selling this product, they will compete much more, prices will come down much more. And I remember at this meeting feeling, feeling very self-conscious because I didn't want to use the word Kurno in a meeting of the prime minister, finance minister, and other bureaucrats. It would sound crazily academic. But I wanted to explain in words, and I did that, that you, know, you have to release smaller amounts. So instead of auctioning 1,000 metric ton to one person, we should auction 100 metric tons to 10 persons and have many more players being unleashed onto the market. This was an idea that was taken. There were many other ideas which I've tried with, which were not. The other one, which is not just my idea, but a whole lot of people were pushing, was the use of auctions for the 3G auction. And again, to be pointed out, economics is full of areas where it is intuition, gut feeling, looking at numbers and guessing roughly what is the right policy. A lot of monetary fiscal policy is that, but there are also domains of economics which are like engineering. Auction theory is developed like engineering field. And if you design your auction right, you can do phenomenally well. And the 3G auction was a phenomenal success. I'm running a bit behind time, so I better speed up. Now, Things were going well, but of course the global crisis comes, it slows down. There were the corruption scandals which were beginning to break. India's growth was slowing down a little bit, but nevertheless, ups and downs, India remained a global growth story up to 2016. All over the world, people were talking about India being among the three, four fastest growing economies of the world. After 2016, India has had a bad times in terms of pure economics. And it is very important. We are so sensitive that we immediately apportion blames. And even before we apportion blames, we turn to look away from the data. We must not look away from the data. The data does show that the economy is doing very well, very badly. I think India's fundamentals are very strong. So there is absolutely no reason to believe that we will continue to flounder. We can get out of it, but for that, you have to look at the numbers in the face so that you understand what's happening. That the economy started doing in 2016, badly after 2016, actually did catch me as a bit of a surprise because I do have disagreements with some of the ideology of the government. I want India to be secular, inclusive, everyone part of it, but I had thought that the economy is going to do very, very well in India. So it caught me by surprise when the economy begins to do badly, because when I look at the policies that have been undertaken in India in the last five years, there are good and bad policies. There were some very good policies like the insolvency and bankruptcy code that was brought in, I think was very, very valuable. The cutting the ease of doing business, making it easier to do business, I think were the right steps taken. GST, very badly implemented. We can't get away from the fact that it was badly implemented, but it, was, it is a powerful idea. It can do a lot of long run good, and that was done. 
but there were also policy mistakes. I think demonetization was a big policy mistake. We, a country like India should not have done that. And as there are government reports that talk about the kinds of countries that have done similar demonetization, we don't want to be in, those, in the list of those countries like Venezuela, North Korea, which have done this kind of demonetization. That was a policy mistake. The other policy mistake was the way the lockdown was done was a policy mistake because the migrants, we gave no thought to the migrants. So the migrants spread all over. So the lockdown in some sense was one of the strongest lockdowns in the world. But in another sense, it was one of the weakest lockdowns in the world because some 23 to 40 million people we now know were for two weeks scattered all over India, which they normally would not be. So it's the most unlocked down lockdown that is taking place. And so that strangled the economy and actually did not do well with the virus. So there were policy mistakes, but there were good policies as well. But why is the economy doing so badly? And here's the data on the Indian economy. 2016, 2017, up to that time, India is doing very well. Growth that year was 8.2%. Next year, growth was down from 8.2% to 7.2%. Next year, that is 2018-19, growth was down from 7.2 to 6.1. The next year, 2019-20, before the pandemic, growth is down to 4.2%. And this year, the pandemic year, well, we don't know. Anywhere, let's say from minus 8% to minus 11% will be the growth, whatever it is. Four consecutive years, of each year's growth being less than the previous year's growth has never happened before in independent India. And so the bulk of this is before the COVID hits that we've already begun slowing down. What is causing this? I'll look at this briefly and I'll just take about another 10 minutes, uh, six, seven minutes actually. I don't want to get Jyoti worried and then I will stop. The fundamental strengths about the economy, I should point out that the information technology sector, the software sector. India is a global leader. I mean, India's services sector growth from about 1992-3, for about 12, 13 years, India's services sector growth was absolutely number one, the fastest growing in the world. And this is mainly in this important sector of information technology, the early corporations, uh, Infosys, uh, Wipro, uh, the Tatas coming in in a big way, give a big boost, boost to India, and India gets the pride of place over there. Pharmaceutical industry, the generic production, India is a major player. Automobile, automobile part, India has become a major player. So there are great strengths. And I also should point out that India's uh, higher education system, with all its faults, it should do much better, but still, it is a phenomenal higher education system. There are top institutes, producing brains for the whole world and they are scattering all over the world. Indians are coming out of India. Indian bureaucracy, we all get very angry with the bureaucracy, but I must point out that in terms of sheer talent, some of the best people are drawn into this. We have to create space for this. Come to the budget, this year's budget. I feel actually it was a pretty good budget. And actually the budget is a step that can take us in a better direction. But so the conditions are being made right. The budget is beginning to give us signals of going in the right direction. But I feel bad in some ways for Nirmala Sitaraman because I don't think the budget alone can save India's economy. India's economy depends as much on economic policy as on the political situation. Contrary to what, to what many economists say, and as I said earlier, an economy does not rely on economics alone. It depends on social norms, on political culture, on institutions. And these are deteriorating in India, and that need not happen no matter which government, what ideology is in power. Bring in the best brains into India, and in terms of the economy, we can provide the conditions that are ne needed. The message of polarization and hatred being spread across India is making our minorities feel alienated. And once this happens, trust begins to break down. And when trust breaks down, investment suffers. And the investment and savings rate in India 
which had gone up to East Asian levels from 2009, 10, actually it had begun coming down even when I was in government, it came down a little, but it's been a steady downward journey. Investment begins to come down and when investment comes down, growth suffers. There is evidence from around the world that the connection between societal trust and growth is strong. And I feel this is what we have to pay attention to, to not allow this to break down. The record deterioration of the Indian economy since 2016 is not inevitable. Our fundamentals, as I just said, are very, very strong. I'm not a political person. As I said, I've never been a part of any political party. As a researcher, I like to pursue the pursuit of ideas and truth is what should be important. Whether or not it violates the party line, whichever party you're in, you should speak out. I also like to believe that Suresh Tendulkar shared my views on this, that as a professional, you want to bring the best ideas to the table. And I'm urging our leaders that that should be the spirit. I want India to flourish and do well, but I don't mean this. I am, as an Indian, I want that to happen, but I don't mean flourishing and doing well solely in terms of wealth and money. We want to build a society where people are happy and well-being is equitably spread across society. I want India to be a global leader, not just to accumulate money and power. I want India to be a global leader so that we can instill a moral compass in the world, in the whole world. By morals, I don't mean narrow-minded morality that we learn. I mean a sense of integrity and honesty, having compassion and empathy for anyone, irrespective of the person's religion, caste, race, even sexual orientation. None of those things should matter. We should try to create a world that is sustainable, where we are not limited by the narrow boundaries of the nation, but reach out to anybody in need. I know all this sounds idealistic, and I know this cannot happen overnight, but this is what we must aspire to. In fact, if the world continues, the whole world, if it continues the way it is going now, exploiting our environment, working only with narrow self-interest, it is likely that the world will not survive. Our current behavior globally is not sustainable. What I'm aspiring to, what I feel we should all aspire to is a, not just a dream, but a survival strategy. India is a part of this. And India began with very, very bold thoughts. We were global leaders. As I said, there was a lot of respect. And today, even if we begin to take right economic policies as I think the budget has done, we need to shore up these political elements, surrounding elements to get India back again, growing rapidly, which India can do. With those words, let me stop. If there are questions, I'll be happy to take. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, sir, for your enlightening and charging lecture. We've revised the whole of Indian economy starting before 18 till now, and we've got a very thorough concept now. Sir, with, uh, you have given and made us revise the concept starting from Adam Smith, and coming and touching down with a lot of uh, concepts that we have started as uh, coming up of behavioral economics and Austrian school of thought with a lot of non-government interference. Then again, coming down to a lot of interference and uh, contribution by government. Then uh, you have in the end talked about sustainability, which really motivated us and showed us the way forward. Thank you so very much for this lecture, sir. With this, I would like to now request my colleague, Professor Roy, to steer the question answer round, please. Well, thank you, Professor, Professor Roy. Nihar yeah, okay. thank you, Professor Niharika. Well, sir, it was indeed a very insightful and very, very interesting lecture. I personally loved it. Uh, so we'll begin the question and answer session. Uh, although there are lots of questions, but we have half an hour for that. So we'll start with one of our students. The rule is very simple. You can just briefly in three to five words, you can just introduce yourself and then ask the question. So we'll start with uh, our student, Mayuk Sen. Mayuk, could you please uh, unmute yourself? Yes, sir. Yeah. A very good evening, sir. 
I am Mayuk Sen. I'm currently pursuing my master's at Simbaji School of Economics. I'll be graduating in June. Uh, now, sir, whenever we talk about uh, economic reform, and as you have rightly pointed out, Mayuk, you froze for me. I don't know whether this Isn't happened to this... anyone. I missed you for about 30 seconds. Um, you can repeat, Mayuk. Switch off your camera. Maybe you'll okay, get a good okay. yeah. yeah. Apologies for that, sir. Apologies. Uh, so, sir, my question is, uh, whenever we talk about economic reform, 1991 comes as a spotlight, spotlight year, as you also pointed out. Uh, now it is 2021 and there is advent of deliberation revolving around privatization, privatization of the public sector undertakings. So, sir, will this policy be considered as a major determinant for economic reform, future economic reform in Indian perspective? Uh, Mayu, yeah. Mayuk, in general, uh, I believe that there's a lot of scope for privatization in India. Uh, it is over centralized state owned. And that is not a good thing. I should, however, clarify the position that, that I do take. In many important sectors, you need the private sector, but you also need the public sector. So you don't want to sell it all out together. And one line which um, a lot of American economists in New York Times and other places took after the big crisis of 2008 is that if you had a few big state-owned banks, the banks all moving in the same direction, when you get a crisis, all of them run in the same direction. There's nothing you can do because if you're being driven by profit, all of you will run in the same direction. You need a few big banks which will say, okay, we will take a loss, but we will not join in the run. And that can break the societal run in one direction. So you do need both. But I do believe that broadly, you need a privatization so that the private sector plays a bigger role. But one thing you have to be very, very careful. It's very easy in a country like India which we had seen in early Pakistan that had happened when we would talk about 22 families controlling all of Pakistan. India has that risk. So when you're privatizing, you have to make sure that you want a country with lots of small private players. So you must not have it privatized, but all owned by a couple of big players. That will cause a, a kind of a monopoly problem, which is not good for economy. So keeping a lot of these details in mind, you have to do it. Let me point out that I had taken a position on the farm bills, the farm laws on which a lot of criticism was made, which is a very similar point. I do believe that the private sector ought to be brought in, but you have to put in a lot of safeguards. So a lot of the validity or error lies in the details. You have to put in a lot of safeguards so that you have a competitive presence of the private sector and not just a capture of a few big firms. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, next, uh, we can see a lot of hand raise uh, from the audience. Uh, what uh, we can do is we'll, uh, next question we'll take from Professor uh, Narendra Pani. Uh, if you can. Uh, yeah. Very good. Uh, to see. Professor Narendra Pani, are you there? <clears throat> Thank you for that, uh, that fascinating lecture on, uh, and your consistent efforts to bring the moral back into economics. Uh, my uh, question really is, uh, uh, is that if you were in Dr. Manmohan Singh's position in 1991, uh, would you have done anything differently uh, with the benefit of hindsight? Very good question, uh, Narendra. So good to see you, uh, looking in great shape. So yeah, after many years, I'm seeing uh, Narendra Pani. So um, you're putting me in a spot because I have to think very hard. There were many things I'm sure I would do uh, differently. Uh, the broad orientation, I was completely with it. You know, I, though I think historically, my sympathies were much more with the left. During the 1991 reforms in the popular columns that I was writing in newspapers, I was very greatly supportive. And a lot of my friends were getting angry that you're supporting the wrong policies. But I felt that that's the right way to go. I, without going sort of into the details of uh, what was being done at that time, I can tell you broadly my line, which I feel should be done even now. I am a believer that you have to create a lot of space for the market, so the free market, the private players, but redistribution is also important. So 
I would like the government to be small, but a taxing government that quickly does transfers. You do have wealth tax because you don't want people to be born poor. You do want some transfers taking place at the time of birth from people who are being born very rich to people who are being born very poor because at birth, you cannot say you're being born poor because you didn't work hard. That's just plain unfair the way life is. So I would have gone for a little bit more of those kinds of instrumentation, instruments of redistribution, but freeing the market, I believe. So the government should not interfere in everyday matters. It should do quick interference and then make some transfers and let it go. That is the broadly the direction in which I would push. Also, which India didn't do too badly, we do know in retrospect that shoring up even more, the sort of basic needs part of it, the human development, which was mentioned earlier, those indicators part of it in 1991 would have been useful. But on the whole, I was a complete outsider that time, but I felt for the first time, I'm seeing India making the right moves. And I was very pleased that that was happening. So we'll take one question from the audience. Uh, um, Sita Prabhu, ma'am, are you there? Can you hear me? If it is possible for you to uh, unmute and ask, your question. Unable to unmute. Okay. So yeah, over. right now, yeah, yeah. Now it's, uh, I'm able to unmute. Yes. Uh, yes. Pro, pro, yeah. Professor Basu, great lecture as usual. Delighted to hear you once again. Uh, my question to you is, you've just mentioned about uh, redistribution and about, uh, you know, the need for that. But I think the inequality in India, particularly in the education sector has been very high. And while uh, higher education has been given a great deal of importance, could we not have done better on the uh, basic education and look at the secondary education level now? And India can't move ahead with such a backlog of uh, you know, educationally deprived population. And that also affects the intergenerational transmission of poverty. So should we not be doing much more on this? And that's one. And secondly, to invest in social sectors, a related question, the time horizon due to electoral considerations is so very uh, short. Uh, it's uh, parties are moving from a uh, five year term to about almost three years in their time horizon looking at investments. If that is the case, then how on earth are we going to ensure adequate investment in education and private sector alone may not be sufficient for this and we need uh, much greater investment by the government and public sector, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Sita Prabhu, again, after ages, I didn't see you, but I just heard your voice. This is all making me just so nostalgic for uh, my earlier times. And you came in at the right point, just as I had mentioned, uh, UNDP and human development. So let me take on, take on your two questions. Inequality, that's actually exactly right. India is, India's uh, inequality in education. Uh, India's performance, and I'm going back right up to 1947, has had this strange dichotomy, which is a very unfortunate dichotomy. In terms of higher education, we could really be proud of what we have done in terms of higher education. Uh, and I, I've said this many times before that when in my early days in the Delhi School of Economics and you people, the young faculty there in Symbiosis will feel, I used to go to an occasional international conference. It would be dominated of course by the Europeans and Americans. But I used to feel as an Indian, never felt at any disadvantage. I just felt that I had had as good an education as anyone else. And I felt India was really among the developing countries, the only country that stood out where the people, all the Indians would feel completely comfortable that we are a part of this, which is otherwise an America Europe uh, meeting, which is a testimony to our early institutes. The IITs, even the universities doing very well, the IIMs, India was a complete forerunner. But it's a very strange uh, um, uh, dichotomy that if you look at literacy in India, I remember I used to follow this data very carefully up to the 1990s or so. There were many sub-Saharan African countries doing much worse than us, doing better in terms of basic literacy. It had crossed over. And Bangladesh, for instance, was beginning to invest much more in education than we were doing the basic level of education. So India was this very, very polar country. The well-educated Indians are absolutely the world-class, but a very big mass was not being educated. This I think was a fault, very early fault in our design that despite wanting to provide education to everyone, 
we did not do that. This began to change somewhere in the 1990s. You see India's basic literacy is picking up. So there's a little bit of hope that we are now aware of that and we are trying to spread it much bigger. With that, I must give you a word of warning. Higher education, where India was made early investments and came right up to the top. The culture of higher education is a freedom of space that you need, of speech and ideas. What has happened in recent times is the crackdown on free speech, that is not good for us. The strength of a higher educational institute is people must talk, debate, discuss. I remember from my visit to Israel, there are many things I would criticize about the Israel government and government policy, but what was wonderful to see was the vibrancy of the debate. In standing in the forum, people criticizing the government freely, and that is what is giving the country the strength. We must not lose that. If we lose that, then higher education will begin to crumble, which is our strength. So we want to bring up basic education without, without causing that to crumble. Uh, Sita Prabhu, um, the social sector and the electoral cycle, this is, of course, India's age old story that we wake up every five years and just in time begin to show this up. It is the electoral cycle is too clear. We do want this to become stronger. But again, then again, you're right that even in the social sector, I personally believe you have to bring in the private sector, the small private players to weave in. I used to argue about even the things like distribution of food, which we do. You do want food to be distributed to poor households, but in the distribution mechanism, you want to intertwine the private sector. Everything does not have to be done by the government collecting the food, bringing the food, handing it over. You can have the private sector playing a role for its own profit woven by the government. For that, you need design. And once again, since for everything, there's the good and the bad, I want to point out that one of the problems that has happened in recent times, we have faltered in terms of the design. The lockdown was a very good example. The big announcement I had welcomed when it first happened, then within two, three weeks, you realize that it had not been professionally planned at all, and it was going out of control. The GST, the design was very poor. It's completely shocking why it had to be, why such a good plan was so poorly designed. And once again, when you want to bring in the private sector into the social welfare and distribution, the design is crucial. And we have to admit, we have done the design very, very poorly. We have to do that professionally. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for this elaboration. I also have a question with respect to school education that I'll keep it for maybe towards the end, I'll ask. Uh, so now I would like to invite uh, Professor uh, Somesh Mathur from IIT Kanpur. Uh, sir, if you can quickly unmute yourself and ask good, the question. Good, good evening, uh, Professor Basu. I am a neighbor of your uh, student, uh, Praveen, uh, here at IIT Kanpur. Uh, I don't have a question, but uh, an observation because I was also neighbor of Professor Tendulkar, who was a very simple man, but a disciplined man at every uh, 5 p.m. every day, he would take a walk and uh, it was in the circular park. And we would all uh, together come from the other side to pose a question uh, to him. And uh, the question was, that why does poverty persist? Uh, how to break uh, this, uh, this uh, poverty trap? Wherein is it that the low productivity uh, leads to uh, you know, the uh, low return jobs? Or is it the prevalence of low return jobs uh, which leads to lower productivity? So that has been there for last 30, 35 years. Uh, uh, but it, it keeps coming back and with your lecture, uh, those, those things have come back. I have other things on um, uh, the, the media council. I mean, if you can have uh, uh, how, how to take care of things which are coming in the social media, is it self-regulation or should we have uh, something like the, the media council, so social media council? Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, uh, Somesh. Uh, say hello to Praveen. He was one of my first Cornell PhD students. Brilliant uh, chap, I haven't been much in touch. When you talk about Suresh and his perfect discipline, 
I began by saying there are lots of things I share with Suresh, the values, the moral principles, the interest in the world of ideas. One thing I don't share, but I aspire to that he had is discipline. I'm a very indisciplined person, so you would never be sure that you would find me at the time that you saw me the previous evening. With that, let me get into the question that you're asking. The persistence of poverty um, uh, is a very, very tricky question because it just continued in India for a very, very long period. I personally believe that the mistake was that we were attending to poverty not realizing that the poverty is intertwined with the economy, just as earlier I was saying the economy is intertwined with politics and society. Poverty is intertwined with the economy. 1991, the reforms that were brought in by Manmohan Singh and very importantly, Narasim Rao uh, 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 providing that space for the reform to be brought in, made it possible for the economy to take off, which was crucial. You can't just focus on poverty and let the economy crumble. So that took off. I, as I, to Narendra Pani's question, as I was mentioning, there should have been more focus directly on poverty at that time. But however, 1991 turns out to be a important year because after that poverty is beginning to fall. And after that, basic education and literacy is beginning to pick up. So whatever be the cause, we are beginning to crack that at that point of time. And I feel as far as mass poverty goes, we will go through a very difficult one or two years, but that is not anyone's fault. It's the pandemic, which is going to cause a poverty problem all around the world. India will face that. But the poverty we will probably begin to climb out of. But I personally, am also worried about inequality. You can't have inequality beyond a certain level and have a vibrant, good society. Because we know this from the level of the nation to the village council, as has been pointed out, in a village council, democracy does not flourish. If you have two, three very wealthy people, the poorest farmers are tongue-tied. They cannot talk anymore. But this is also true at the societal level. If you have huge inequality, then democracy begins to suffer. People lack voice. So what we need to turn to today is also inequality. We want inequality mitigation and India's inequality is going up. We are getting into a sort of cronyist country of a kind that there was always a tendency, but we were not quite that. We have a tendency to get to that. So the focus has to be inequality. And on this, Somesh, I don't know how much you are pushing me into this, but I want to point out there are big challenges because technology, this is a global challenge, not just for India. The way technology is coming in and replacing traditional labor I feel from here onwards over the next five, 10 years, you will see turmoil. Some countries in the world that were doing well going down, some countries that were doing badly coming up because the technology is causing an upheaval of the kind that we had seen last during the industrial revolution. And the industrial revolution we survived because we thought radically of novel policies, new policies, new ways of intervening. We need to do that now. Otherwise, inequality is going to increase. We will get political uh, trouble and turmoil all over the world. So this is also a time for new ideas. And once again, I would say this everywhere, but people wouldn't be interested. But since this is symbiosis, this is a top college, I want to point out, it's very important to realize the industrial revolution, the roughly 100 years, say from 1750 to 1850, also coincided with the most radical time in terms of understanding of economy. Adam Smith, 1776, his classic being published. John Stuart Mill, 1848. In between comes David Ricardo, a little earlier, Augustine Cournot. This 100 year period or roughly 100 year period is a period of novel thinking, reconceptualizing the economy, and that allowed us to come out of it. So for research, this is also a very exciting time. How do you take on the changing landscape of production in the world? Thank you, sir. So now, uh, next we have uh, Mr. Deepak Mohuni. I will ask the question on his behalf, uh, and which is related to the current scenario, sir. So here it is. US and other governments have unleashed massive stimulus packages and many continues with more. They have no doubt staved off a more severe crisis, but how will all this end? What happens to all the debt that has been taken on? 
if the stimulus results in the economic boom rather than a mere recovery, could such packages become the new normal even without a crisis? Thank you. Uh, what's your name? Just curiosity. Uh... So this question was asked by uh, Mr. Deepak Moh Mohoni. Mohoni, okay. Yeah, Deepak Mohoni. So uh, very good question. Uh, it's an unknown territory, uh, what um, we are getting into in the United States, but I feel the US had no choice. This part had to be done exactly the way it was done, a massive stimulus package. And I believe, for instance, that that is also the way India has to do it, a massive stimulus package. If you need, you borrow money, you print money, you go for the massive stimulus package. But, and that is a big but, uh, what do you do later on is very important because you can't keep this up. What you're saying is, will this become normal practice? That can't happen. You can't keep up a stimulus package like this for too long. You will spark off inflation and other things. So you right now, the economic suffering in the United States, we are getting data. At the bottom segment of the population, it is very bad. And in developing countries, wherever data is coming from, the poor people are suffering in a big way. And the biggest suffering I should point out is not the farming community and the rural areas. It's the small businesses. They are being hit very badly. And so we do need a big stimulus package the way United States has moved. I think this budget showed signs of moving a little bit in that direction, which I like about the budget, but India needs more. Having done that, you have to think of the unwinding because you can't continue with that for too long. And a lot of the detail of what happens in the real life will depend on the unwinding. That's a big challenge. We will work that out. But I think what has been done by the Biden administration right now and is being pushed through is exactly right. You want a big a stimulus to be pushed in. And then within months, you should have professional committees sitting to design how you're going to unwind this over the long run so that it does not become endemic, which will be a problem for United States and the rest of the world. And I should also point out, I'm currently doing some work with a bunch of economists here, Joseph Stiglitz most prominently, about the global situation that we are trying to write up that, you know, United States has to be mindful of stimulus package and the need in other countries. And here we are talking of the really the poorest countries, which are not able, they are not able to borrow because no one will lend to them. For them, the stimulus package is very hard and you need a global move and United States has to take some concern about the world and the poorer parts of the world and be involved. Well, thank you, sir. Now uh, we will again move on uh, to uh, ask uh, from our student, uh, Amanpreet uh, Gala. I, can you please uh, unmute yourself and uh, ask you about your question? He's from first year masters. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, greetings, professor. Uh, and thank you for your insights through this lecture. Uh, professor, um, so through the years, the government and the system of governance has been blamed for inefficiency in India. Uh, I would like to know your opinion on this statement, whether citizens should equally be blamed. We are kind of in the, it, like an enabler in some sense for the inefficiencies when we choose the short way out of the red tapeism instead of fighting it, for example. So how can we reduce this deadweight loss due to this in the system? Thank you. Uh, Amanpreet, you know, at one level, yes, it is our collective problem. But even if it is the citizens responsible, that becomes a scientifically useless thing. If I know that it's, it's a problem of all of us, Yes, it's a problem. What do we do? We can't just change over everyone. So even if that is so, you want to locate the main responsibilities. And so I do put a lot of this responsibility on the government. Uh, that, yes, at one level, it's a collective thing. It's a part of our psychology, the way we behave. And we should, of course, continue to do behavioral economics and teach ordinary people that honesty, integrity, these things are good. Not First of all, they are morally good. We should all do that inclusiveness. For me, the biggest thing is human beings are human beings, no matter who they are, and we must treat them equally. All these things we should teach people. But over and above that, the government has a responsibility, a direct responsibility. And that is true for these things. And it is also true for this important thing of inefficiency that you're talking about. The government has to take a lead on that. 
I was doing one thing which was quite interesting. This is a piece of history, not really relevant now. When I was in the government of India, uh, the Indian bureaucracy would always trouble me. And I had used an analogy. The Indian bureaucracy is like getting a group of ace drivers, some of the world's best drivers, and getting them locked in a traffic jam. You will never discover their dri driving ability. The Indian bureaucracy itself was locked in a traffic jam. And my thought that time was India has inherited the bureaucratic structure from Britain. It is from the colonial times that our bureaucracy has been inherited. But today there are other countries which are historically the British system, which have become much more efficient countries. Australia, for instance, Britain in itself, it's reformed its bureaucracy. I was meeting the ambassadors of all these countries when I was in government, trying to see with the same historical inheritance what is it that Australia had changed, that the Australian government had become much more efficient? I feel you need detailed work of that kind. The first steps that were taken in the ease of doing business in India recently, I think were the right steps. You want to ease up doing business. But there were so many implementation faults after that, that I just feel that we are not bringing in the best talents into government. And whenever you're bringing in best talents, those are free floating human beings. They will make critical remarks. And it should be our sign of our self-confidence that we should be able to take that criticism. So it's in that spirit that we have to approach this very, very important problem that you're talking about. Well, thank you, sir. Uh, next, we have uh, Gautam Prakash, sir. So if you can quickly uh, unmute and ask your question. Yeah. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, great lecture by you. Thank you so much. Uh, sir, my question is on the issue of reforms going forward. Uh, so many people who uh, write on these issues, uh, they opine that going forward, the reforms which, are, which we will have to go for, those are going to be very, very difficult and they are likely to meet a lot of resistance. Uh, so my request to you is, could you throw some light on what these reforms are going to be and what will be the likely sources of resistance? Thank you, yeah. sir. This is the kind of thing, uh, Gautam, where I'll take, of course, much more time. I'll have to be in a locked room, think through, make a plan of the reforms ahead, but I can just give you the sort of broad outlines of the way I think India ought to go. Uh, as I've said, my own instinct is always that in everyday matters, you don't want a big government. You want government to be relatively lean and non-interfering. As soon as you get the government giving permission for everything, those permissions always go to the few big players who are very close to the government. They will corner all the permissions and you will end up actually in a worse economy, which is a completely globally controlled economy. So that is not the way to go. But what you do want a redistributive economy. You can't tolerate the level of inequality that is happening in India, which is beginning to be reminiscent of the worst economies in the world, where a few people are becoming phenomenally rich and the bottom end is remaining completely flat. And that problem has got worse. There are Oxfam reports. Thomas Piketty has written about it over the last five, six years that's going worse. And there's one particular data I should point to, which is not being talked about enough, but we should all be aware of. This is very critical data, but it is hard data and you, we must not look away from it. Malnutrition, NFHS, which does some of the best studies a few months ago, put out data for 22 Indian states and uh, union territories. So it's not an all India data, but it is 22 states. For the first time over the last five year period from 2015 to 2019, malnutrition has increased slightly. So the height of children, height for age for children below the age of five years has gone down, which is very rare. A developing country, usually malnutrition keeps improving and malnutrition is not something that any of us or even the lower middle class people will suffer. Malnutrition is something which the poorest segment suffers. So that part of India is clearly doing worse, even if people are going above the poverty line. They are so close to the poverty line that malnutrition has increased and that's extremely worrying. So I would put a lot of attention on that, that you want India to be a, a, a country where the business is spread across lots of producers, lots of entrepreneurs, and you're doing things about inequality. 
The other thing that I would stress, and once again, that is something that this government has not done well enough at all, scientific education. Scientific education is extremely important, but as soon as you're making room for scientific education, you're creating a vibrant sector at the top, which will be a critical, critical free speech sector. But so what? We should be strong enough to be able to take that free speech area. For that, I would, for instance, which I said earlier, India's higher education was the early strength, which gave India a global stature of a kind, which is very rare for a developing country. So I would go back and put in a lot of effort into higher education and free media. You want media to be free and diverse. And it is at one level, the government's responsibility to push for that, even critical media. You want to make that free because ideas come from that. You don't like the criticism, but in that criticism, you pick up an idea that yes, this is going wrong. Like for instance, the malnutrition that I point out, there should be free discussion of that. Why is India from 2015 to 2019, not in all the 22 states and union territories, but in 13 of them, malnutrition has gone up, which is a surprising development. These things with higher education being vibrant, you will have open discussion. And if you're open discussion, if you allow with confidence, you will use that to reform policy. So broadly in this domain is where I would develop a package for India to move ahead. Fantastic idea, sir. Now from here, we'll move on to uh, Professor Ishita Ghosh. Uh, could you please unmute yourself and ask the question? Kindly unmute. Am I audible? Yes, yes. I, you are. Yes, okay. uh, Hello again. So yes, go on. I have I have two questions. Uh, I think I'll ask one because there are many others here. Um, so the uncategorized sector in India acts as a safety valve for absorbing excess. I missed the people. critical word. Which sector? The unorganized sector. Yeah, organized sector, yeah. Uh, the impact of trade on wages and, and employment in the unorganized sector can have far-reaching implications for how the poor are affected by trade. And in order to absorb excess labor through higher exports and to minimize displacing labor through higher imports, it becomes vital to develop strong linkages between the organized and unorganized sectors in the economy. So in this context, uh, what is your take on the economic self-reliance that is being encouraged in India, given the huge sections of unorganized labor and their lack of relevant skills? Would this transition to self-reliance materialize anytime soon, if at all? Uh, Ishita, um, I, I missed out a few words, but I, I think I broadly yes. got the spirit of your talk, mm -hmm. of your question. Um, the unorganized sector is extremely important. Uh, in India, if you look at labor data, you will discover those who do this work is that the self-employed category is very high. And the self-employed basically means a tiny unorganized work that you're doing. You're selling some product on the roadside, et cetera. So large number of uh, Indians are in that sector. That is a challenge for India. At one level, that is a opportunity as well. And let me just explain. India tends to be an over-regulating country. We sort of over-regulate. The unorganized sector escapes that regulation. So it has that opportunity of mobility and space that the organized sector very often does not have. And that is, by the way, one reason why more of India has remained unorganized because the unorganized people, if they have an option, those who have, they prefer to remain unorganized so, so that they don't come under the scrut scrutiny of the state authority and regulation. So that is the structure of the India's economy. I feel, and some time ago, I wrote a newspaper op-ed with Ella Bhatt, Ella Ben, and I wrote together with a little bit of sense of distress about contemporary India, that what is happening? We, in a country where there is so much of unorganized work, we are paying so little attention to them and their welfare. And really we were distressed about the way we treated our own migrants, millions of our own migrants. And we wrote this piece. And that goes to the heart of the point in developing our policies. This relatively invisible sector, which is the unorganized sector, we have to 
pay attention to this, the rising inequality that I'm talking about, the rising inequality, you capture it in terms of NSS data, consumption data, and then you realize what's happening is that the organized sector, which is very visible, which we are studying all the time, those are probably gradually doing better because all the attention is over there, whereas the unorganized sector is being left scrambling. So a lot of the policy design, once again, and I keep coming back to the importance of design, because we think of economics as all intuition, which it is not. What makes economics a more difficult problem, and the unorganized sector is a great example of that, is economics is part intuition, part engineering skills. If it was all intuition, yes, there would be nothing to be done. Any politician would be as good as any professional. If it was all engineering, it would be easy because no politician would try to do it. They would give it to economists and professionals to do it. Economics is a strange hybrid. And so we have to bring in our skills to look at the sector and the sector that you are pointing to is really the big challenge is the unorganized sector. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, now we have uh, one question with respect to privatization. So Nidhi Menon, do you have Nidhi Menon? Uh, could you please unmute quickly and ask your question very briefly because we have already uh, running short of time. Maybe we'll, we can take uh, one or two more questions with your permission, sir. Maybe and, just uh, two more because, uh, yeah. I, okay. That we don't go for too long, but let's take Nidhi's question. Yes, sir. Uh, Nidhi, uh, are you there? Okay, no problem. I will read uh, uh, from her behalf. Uh, I, I, I have the text of the question, which is, uh, can privatization and infrastructure development be a strategy for economic recovery, perhaps a watershed moment for India? I don't think it's the watershed, uh, the private sector. Uh, I feel the uh, allowing greater space for the private sector is important. We must do that. But the watershed moment for India is that there are just two things. One is the politics. If we don't get our politics right, then you can continue to pri uh, privatize India. And we've got examples from around the world, from Latin America, it's a wild privatization. Nothing happens, the economy crashes. So the privatization is an important component, but you do need a politics of inclusivity so that society stands together, which is not happening in India. Number two, the landscape of the economy is changing. From the old fashioned work, the notion of work is changing. Countries that produce a labor force that is ready for this completely new work where a lot of the traditional unskilled work is going to be taken away from us, us by machines. And bulk of the work is going to be creative work, which machines can't quickly take away from us, and we will have to do. Unless we change our education system towards that, we will not be in the forefront. So the privatization is important, but not a watershed change. The watershed changes is the politics. The watershed change is the change for technology and design as to how we relate to that. Okay. So now, sir, we will have the final question. Maybe I'll ask and then I'll add also from our student very smart question, which is related to the online teaching learning we are experiencing. So first I'll pose my question that is related to school education. So school education in last three decades, in your opinion, do you think that we have spent good amount of uh, money, uh, or, which I think partly you have already ans answered. Now, is the spending is efficient, even if it is not good? So that is like, a, a, and if it is not, what is the way forward? So that is one part of my question. And then I'll also invite our student, uh, bachelor student Rahul Batra after that uh, to pose the final question, sir. Okay. Krishna, let me actually take this on. This is a, a good question. I'm glad you brought up about the school education. I recently wrote an article where I'm betting that South Korea is going to do even better than what it's already done. You know, South Korea stands out for one very strange sector. Some of the richest people in South Korea are school teachers. Uh, it, that market has become a very vibrant market with the consequence that some of the most brilliant minds are being drawn into school teaching. Now, I'm not talking about the wealth and uh, money of the school teachers, but to be able to draw the best talents into school teaching is very important. And I feel that this is one area where there is 
systematic market failure that takes place. So you need a little bit of government action to attract the best teachers into school. The reason is school teacher, if I'm paying, I'm thinking of my future. I'm paying for my children. I'm thinking of my children's future. And so I'm willing to pay a fair amount of uh, struggle in other ways, but pay for good school teaching. But if my child gets well-educated, my grandchildren will be better educated and their grandchildren and children will be better educated. So once you get a well-educated person, the, that effect cascades down for many generations. Those future children are not able to pay money to get a, uh, for the uh, education of their great-great-grandfather because they, are, they don't exist. So this is an area where there is a market failure. If you can correct that market failure by attracting the best talents into school teaching, you will get benefits running over the next 50 years because it's a multi-generational effect. There's research done by very good scholars, by my friend Joseph Zira and Galore. Uh, they've done wonderful research. Abhijit Banerjee has done very good research, theoretical research. And we have empirical studies and South Korea stands as an example for that. I feel the value of the teacher is much greater than what the market gives because the value cascades down to future generations and we want to bring in the best talents into that and school teaching even more important than college teaching because that's the foundation and so yes the short answer is there should be a huge effort in that thank you very much sir and you have given some inputs and i'll definitely read your article also now here we would like to invite our student a bachelor student rahul batra to come forward and ask uh, his question which is related to the recent online um, hi, sir. Uh, Rahul here. So my question basically comes down to the fact that uh, when the national education policy was released last year, um, if I'm not wrong, it doesn't have any indication towards online learning or how they're going to bridge the gap for people who can't really afford online learning, right? And all of us know education, education policies take years and years uh, for them to amend it and uh, take action on it, right? So um, what kind of policy would you be thinking or would you suggest to the government uh, that can be implemented to bridge this gap for people who can't really afford uh, online learning because we've seen articles where uh, parents have committed suicide because they couldn't afford uh, gadgets for their uh, children so that they can uh, learn effectively. Uh, Rahul, um, you know, I haven't studied the education policy well enough uh, to be able to comment about that, but I can generally tell you that online learning uh, for a country like India is both a source of hope and despair. Uh, the hope part first is at one level, if we can get people onto online learning, then people sitting in remote areas, tribal areas far away, where good teachers are not going to go there to teach. If we can have the teachers sitting in Pune and lecturing to them sitting in, in a tribal area, but you have little assistants, like you have teaching assistants over there in the local village who then help them. You will be able to bring the children sitting in faraway places in contact with the best teachers sitting in, in uh, urban centers. So online teaching gives us scope for that. And the training that we have got, thanks to the period of the pandemic of, over the last one year, not that I would wish that on anyone, this kind of a pandemic to learn, but we have learned online teaching, that's the scope. But if there are people who don't even have the basic amenities and equipment, as you're pointing out, to get that hookup, then the disparity is going to grow. The ones who don't have that hookup are going to be left completely floundering in society, whereas the segment that is getting a hookup is going to get better education is going to grow up. So that is the risk, but there is also scope. And it's through this that we have to steer this once again for this you need professional design. And I'm harping on this because I think there's a great deficiency of that in India. Well, thank you very much, sir, for this brief and very interesting answer to Rahul's uh, question. Uh, that brings to the end of Q&A session. It's uh, 9.28. And now I would like to request our professor, uh, Dr. Ishita Ghosh, to deliver a vote of thanks. Professor Ichita, can you please? Thank add? you, KK. Um, I think I'm audible better this time. Yes, yes, you are very much audible. Okay, okay. So uh, let me begin by saying how enthralling this was. And uh, Professor Basu, I think I've been cured of my pandemic blues in these couple of hours. You have 
set me straight for the next one year. I am going to take in anything that the pandemic brings over now. Uh, uh, I, I really want to put on record the kind of wide ranging insights from all kinds of disciplines that you brought in together today. You uh, have woven them, uh, logically connecting them, and you've uh, brought in the references so beautifully that it was an absolute, absolute delight. And uh, thank you so much for ending on the note that although we are going to look at uh, the survival of the fittest and that there are going to be policies that want to maximize, that want to optimize, in the end, it is only universal brotherhood and uh, ethics and morals and a humane approach that is going to make this world sustainable. Um, in that same note, I want to mention that uh, the Symbiosis International University's uh, motto is the world as one family. And I think uh, your ending comment, your ending note was beautifully echoed in what we believe in. Not only that, this is the 50th year of the Symbiosis family, and uh, it has been a wonderful experience. Uh, I think it has culminated into this wonderful moment, uh, given all the celebrations that we have been um, living in the <clears throat> since the beginning of the 50th year. And uh, we are very, very grateful that you accepted this invite. And uh, we, we learned so many different things. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we are very, very grateful for this opportunity. I would also like to thank uh, Mrs. Tendulkar, uh, Ms. Sai Sapre, Professor Dev Kushundas, because he has given us unwavering support in getting this entire event organized. And of course, our uh, professor and uh, dean of the uh, Faculty of uh, so Humanities and Social Sciences, Dr. Jyoti Chandiramani, uh, for thinking of this event, for thinking of bringing in Professor Basu and for making all this happen. Thank you, KK. Thank you, Niharika. Thank you, Shilpi, Shalmali, Janardhan, all the supporting staff, all the students, alumni, colleagues, and other participants who are here today. Uh, I also want to mention that uh, we have had audience from all over the world over here, uh, including uh, uh, people like um, uh, Professor Anil Bera, uh, Professor uh, Somesh Mathur, and, and many others on the list whom I'm not uh, mentioning right now. And uh, Professor Basu, you'd be happy to note that uh, there are grand students of uh, Professor Tendulkar, who are attending, who attended this event today. So I think uh, it's a it's a very beautiful moment. Thank you, everybody. Ishita uh, Jyoti, thank you very much. I didn't know of your motto that will ring in my head: "The world as one family." It's a lovely yes. one. Yes. Thank you.